We've been on the grind lately. Got a big old pile of origins and name etymology videos in the works. So, being the nice person that I am, I'm going to give you a break from it all and do a math video. Been a while since one of those, after all. So, if you're a fan of math or maths, if you're British, I think you'll like this video. And if this video really gets you going, then our sponsor today will be perfect for you. It's brilliant. Brilliant.org is what I wish I could have initially learned math and science with. Instead of lectures, you learn or brush up on your skills with hands-on, interactive lessons crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals. They're for ages 10 to 110. Foundational to high school math and logic, to science, engineering, and software development, Brilliant puzzles you and keeps your brain polished, which can give you a head start in STEM fields. Which I know tons of you are heading for already, so for sure, why not join the more than 8 million people that are already learning with Brilliant, building STEM intuition and mastering it, rather than just memorizing it to pass some state test. I mean, all this? This is what video games are made of. So it's also great for people interested in getting into game development. So for sure, go to brilliant.org slash Loxton and sign up for free. And also the first 200 people to go to that link will get 20% off of the annual premium subscription. Don't miss out. Now for some Pokemans math. So the catch rate, it's sort of a myth. It's not even a real thing. You've heard things like, oh, A and B plus down help, and oh, there's a 255 catch rate. No, yeah, no, it's a 13% chance catch, but, but why? What is the catch rate? What even is Pokemon math? Oh, and heads up, the programming is nuts fun. So nuts, I'm actually excited to talk about it because programming things like this, as someone who's taken a couple programming courses. I'm glad I didn't have to do it. Also, a lot of things people know about the catch rate is outdated because they've changed the catch rate almost every single generation. Sometimes drastically, sometimes just a little tweak. Uh, but because of that, by the time you see this video, maybe it's Gen 20 and you're looking forward to new Super Canto Remake 6A and new Super Canto Remake 6B, and maybe by that point, none of this is relevant anymore. But for now, we good. So let's gush over some programming. So every gen came with fun little bits of trivia. I mean, did you know that in gen five, the Pokemon would never break free from a Pokeball after two shakes? Yeah, the first shake, fear, oh. Second shape, calm, no need to worry. Third shake, panic. The Pokemon would either always be caught or it would pop out after one or three shakes, never two. What a fun little bit of trivia. Now let's start the real deal by defining what catch rate is. Every Pokemon has a catch rate and they share them with plenty of other Pokemon. Let's just take Bulbasaur, number one, with a normal ball and full health in gen seven, it would be 45. Now the closer that number gets to 255, the easier it is to catch. Why 255? Well, because 255 is the maximum number a single bite can encode. Kinda how Minecraft works on a base 8 system, like most computers, really. It's the same reason that all colors maxed out to white is 255, 255, 255 on the RGB scale. Later though, by Gen 5, they start to use bigger numbers, as we'll see. And that's because they start to use 12-bit integers, which can encode numbers up to 4096. Which also means with two bytes, you can encode 65,536. Yeah, big difference from 255. Let's start with Gen 1. Simpler computers for simpler times. Whoever owned this copy of Pokemon Blue named their Kangaskhan Ah! And it's perfect because it's, I'm fighting a ghost because I'm in the tower. It's not even super hard to follow at this point, so let's just go over it. You throw a ball and the game generates a random number called N for number. This number is based on what ball you use. The number could be between 0 and 255 if it's a Pokeball, 0 to 200 for a Great Ball, and 0 to 150 for the Ultra or Safari Balls. Now, if the Pokemon has a status condition, there's already a chance it could be caught right here. If it's asleep or frozen, and the number it randomly generated happens to be below 25, 
you already catch it. No more math needed, you just get it. And if they are paralyzed, burned, or poisoned, that number becomes 12. So less likely, but still, there's just a chance that you just get it. No more math. So let's say you throw a great ball. It's like rolling a 200-sided die, and as long as it lands on a number below 25, you catch it without question. That's still only a 12.5% chance of catching it, so it's likely to fail. And when it does fail, the game goes on to do some more calculations. It takes n, that randomly generated number based on the ball used, and will subtract 25 or 12 based on the status condition the Pokémon has. And then, if the resulting number is less than the Pokémon's catch rate, you caught it. Otherwise, it escapes. But if it doesn't have a status condition, there's a different calculation it will do. First, there's a different randomly generated number, we'll call it M for Mumber, and now we do some math for the Mumber. You take the maximum HP the Pokémon has, and multiply that by 255, and then multiply that by 4. Take all that and divide it by the total of the current HP times the Ball modifier, the Ball modifier being 12, unless it's a Great Ball, which makes it 8. Curious. Hmm. Oh, and also the number is always rounded down to the nearest whole number, and must be between 1 and 255. But if the answer to that equation is greater than M, congratulations! You got a Mon! Yeah. Simple stuff, right? And with a little math magic, we can calculate that basically as long as you get a Pokémon to less than a third of its HP, you should catch it almost always. Now, there are some more fun oddities to Gen 1, like how busted Sleep and Frozen were. Like, a sleeping, full health Mewtwo takes on average six Ultra Balls to catch, whereas in Generation 2, it can take up to 64 Ultra Balls with the exact same variables just because of how they fixed up the code a bit. Also, funnily enough, Ultra Balls ain't all that Ultra. They're only better when the Pokémon's catch rate is above 50 but below 200, meaning Great Balls are much better suited for the higher and lower numbered Pokémon, which is probably another reason that they changed a lot with the capture rate in Gen 2. Oh, and during all this, they are calculating that really annoying little mechanic that gives you all hope. The shake mechanic. Yeah, it's all for nothing. It's, it's just, just there for style. The math has already been finished by the time the ball hits the Pokémon. It's not calculating three separate calculations here. In fact, the shake calculations only take place if the Pokémon is going to break free anyway. Otherwise, it's just three shakes always. That's the default animation. If it's ever less than that, it'd be, it, it doesn't even calculate the math if you're going to catch it. But yes, if it turns out you're not going to catch that Pokémon, the game does a bit more math. We make a new number, S for shake. This number is the Pokémon catch rate times 100, then divided by the ball type used. If that number is above 256, then it shakes three times before it breaks out which is kind of rude and just wastes your time. But normally this only happens if you miss a really easily caught Mon. It's essentially a taunt. It's wagging its butt at you. <laughs> you failed to catch me. How do you even do that? If the number is below that though, we do another calculation. Let's call it X because I am out of letters, okay? To get X, we use this equation, where E is 10 if the Pokémon is asleep or frozen, or it's 5 if it's paralyzed, poisoned, or burned. And remember, M is our mumber, the one that makes this a shake chance. Now, if this number is less than 10, the ball doesn't even hit the Mon, missing completely, which I don't think I've ever actually seen. I don't think that's happened to me. It's a, it's a critical fail. Then, if the number is above 10 but less than 30, it shakes only once. Above 30 but less than 70, it shakes twice. And if it's larger than that, it shakes three times before breaking free. And all of that, the whole video up until this point, that was the beautifully simple catch rate of Gen 1 explained. Oh, and before we move on to Gen 2, there's this popular myth in the Pokémon community that despite the Master Ball claiming to be a ball that never fails in the original games, there's a teeny tiny chance that it does because of just the way math works. There is no way for the catch rate formula to total a absolute 100% chance even with the Master Ball. So if you were up against a Pokémon with a catch rate of 3, which has full HP and no ailments, it would still work out to having a 0.4% chance of getting out of the Master Ball. 
the master ball can fail. The math there is true, but that statement isn't uh, because the code in the Gen 1 games, which has been completely disassembled by now, uh, we now know that the rules actually say, one, the Master Ball will always catch a catchable Pokemon, and two, if you're not currently using the Master Ball, start the catch rate calculation. The game bypasses the equation with the Master Ball entirely possibly due to that possibility of it failing otherwise. So if you've ever seen it in like a video or something, someone's messing with the game code or video tampering. Now, Gen 2 added a few things and removed some stuff. They added in a modified catch rate, mainly because of the new Pokeballs and making it to where you can't have a zero chance catch rate, meaning there are no Pokemon that are impossible to catch. There's always a chance, no matter what. Unless, of course, it's not permittable, like it's another trainer's Pokemon. But see? Casualization of Pokemon! Right there, people! The games are getting easier! It's not us, it's them! They also changed how the shake probability is calculated, because it really was just nested if statements at the time, like every inexperienced programmer ever, just nesting and nesting and nesting those if statements. They simplified it. Now the modified catch rate will tell you whether or not the Pokemon was caught, and if it's not, then the game will calculate the number of shakes based on this new table, and only generate a new randomly generated number, and compare that to the A from the catch rate. The big difference between the original catch rate and this modified one, though, is that there is no longer ball in the calculation. Rather than the ball used being involved in the equation directly, the ball will change the Pokemon's catch rate itself, and that's put here as rate modified. For example, a Pokeball has a base catch rate of times one, so the Pokemon's catch rate stays the same in this equation, but the Great Ball multiplies it by 1.5 and the Ultra Ball by 2, essentially doubling the catch rate number. They also nerfed status conditions. Now Frozen and Sleep use 0 through 10 instead of 0 through 25, and the others were supposed to be 5, but a coding error makes them 0, so the other status conditions are meaningless. All in all though, here's that equation. Yeah, that's some numbers. Uh, one of the quirks of this calculator is that if your number for HP max times three is bigger than 255, you have a bad time. It sort of halves itself out and boom, you get zero, which is then set to one because zero is illegal. Uh, Gen two is also when they started adding new Pokeballs with gimmicks and the way they work is pretty simple. Take the lure ball, for example. Its catch rate is times one normally, same as a Pokeball, but when fishing, it's times five. Oh gosh, each new Pokeball adds a lot more if checks, doesn't it? But some do get even more complicated, like the heavy ball, which will add instead of multiply. It can add 30, 20, zero, or negative 20 based on the weight of the Pokemon it's being used on. This is going to get a lot more complicated with more balls, isn't it? Moving on! Then came Generation 3, which was so much more complicated that they kept it the same for Generation 4. And here it is. It's actually not that much different. I see that they split up catch rate again, this time making it the base catch rate of the Pokemon. This can still be changed by the Safari Zone and Apricot Ball shenanigans, though. And the ball bonus, the ball multiplier, is now here. They probably separated them, possibly to simplify the whole calculation. The biggest change that we see is that the bonus status is now a total multiplication, which may be why in the Gen 3 and 4 games, statuses made a huge difference. Just kidding, they nerfed them again. Now, instead of 0 through 10, we get 2 for sleeping or freeze, 1.5 for paralyzed poison and burn, and 1 for the rest. I guess it sort of balances out since we're doing a more drastic thing with that number now, but you know it's not a game freak game if there isn't some glaring oversight. If the poison was applied by the move Toxic, it didn't count. Like what? At least they fixed that by the next games. Well, the shake check in this gen is, uh, B equals 10, 48, 56, zero divided by squirt, 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 squirt? Oh, square root, duh. So you take the square root of the square root of 
that number divided by A. A being the answer to the catch value we've already got, and divide this by that number. And all that equals B, which is then compared to a newly randomly generated number between 0 and 65535. If the number is greater than or equal to B, the check fails and repeats four times. If it fails every time, the Pokemon is not caught. If not, it shakes once for every successful check. So up to three times. This is likely where the idea that every time the ball shakes, it's calculating the catch rate. But no, uh, that's this first equation. If A here is greater than 255, you just get the Pokemon and it doesn't even calculate shakes. It only does that if you fail at this first check. But after that, yeah, you could call these shake checks, and each shake corresponds to one check, even though it's done calculating way before the first shake animation is even finished. But I suppose you can think of each shake as like four dice rolls against a dexterity check in D&D, or like Conch Squidward. Could I have this Pokemon? No. Could I have this Pokemon? No. In Generation 5, they kept the base the same, but just changed some variables, like they made Sleep and Frozen 2.5. They also added some calculations for the Intralink Capture Power Buff, essentially multiplying catch rate by 1.1 at level 1, 1.2 level 2, and 1.3 level 3. And these numbers were later changed in Gen 6 to 1.52 and 2.5. They also added the dark grass factor, the tall stuff, remember? Remember how it was said that it was harder to catch Pokemon in the taller, darker grass? Well, yeah, and it's based on this chart. It is based on the total Pokemon caught in the decks. The more you've caught, the harder it gets to catch more. Oh, and in Gen 5, they added critical captures, which are also affected by the number of Pokemon in the decks. Here's that chart. The more mon you have, the more likely you'll get a critical capture. So I guess that sort of balances out. You take A, the result of the modified catch rate, and put it through this chart, then divide that by 6. We'll call this result C for critical. Then we generate yet another random number between 0 and 255 and compare them. If C is greater than this number, then you get a crit, which means it only does the shake check once instead of four times, greatly increasing your chances, but not guaranteeing that you catch it. Nice! And this is basically the same method used in Generation 6 and 7, with only one change in there. In Gen 6, they changed the shake probability to get rid of the square roots. Now it's simply B equals 65,536 divided by 255 divided by A to the power of 0 0.1875. Simpler, but the base equation is still simply A equals three times max HP minus two times HP multiplied by the catch rate times the ball modifier divided by three times max HP multiplied by the status modifier. Then, it does the shake calculations if it needs to for each shake. Unless it's a critical capture, then it only does so once. Oh, and we aren't 100% certain yet, but Gen 8 is believed to be the same, or at least incredibly similar. So, let's start an example. Holy beans, it's Pikachu! So, Pikachu's catch rate is 190. In Gen 1, that means if we had it at half HP and we used the Pokeball, our calculation could go something like this. First, we aren't using a Master Ball and don't have a status effect applied, so we can sort of skip that whole first bit. Then we just randomly generate a number. Uh, 125, that's a nice one. Do a quick calculation. This would mean our total is 102,000 over 600, or 170. Now, we take a look and see if 170 is bigger than 125, and what do you know it is, so you've caught Pikachu. And so it would shake three times, and boom. Hours. Now how would that differ from a more current-ish gen? Well, we still have Pikachu's catch rate of 190, and we're still using a Pokeball, and we don't have any pass powers or a special boost from grass. We don't have statuses or things like that either. We're just raw, half health, and a ball. A would then equal 3 times 100 minus 2 times 50, multiplied by 190 times 1, divided by 3 times 100 times 0. Well, not times 0, but 
there is no status. So it's times no. It's not applicable. So, so times one. So that's three times max HP minus the total of two times the current HP multiplied by the total of the catch rate times ball modifier over three times the max HP, all multiplied by the status modifier. It's simple, right? You like PEMDAS? Our answer here is 38,000 over 300, making it 126.6. Then if we do shake chance after that, four times remember, we would take that number and add it into the calculation with B being a random number between zero and 65,535. So uh, let's do 31, 571, 39, 970, 54, 72, 3, and 57, 0, 18. Man, I'm going to irritate some people with the way I'm saying these numbers. So we do this whole calculation and check the answer against these numbers. B equals 65,536 divided by 255 divided by A, which in this case is 126.6, and that's to the power of 0 0.1875. Uh, or a total equation of all this. So now, if we compare that result to all of our randomly generated numbers individually, we see that all of those numbers are less than B. So we caught the Pikachu. If one of those numbers were greater than B, then you would not have caught the Pikachu. It'd be no chew for you. That last number though was pretty close to not catching it, so we probably could have put it to sleep or used a better ball at least to play it safe. But in the end, it all comes down to if you're lucky. If I had just randomly rolled a higher number, boom, it breaks out. It's all just like rolling a die, like all role-playing games. Are. That's why they're called role-playing games. And in this case, it's a 65,537-sided die, and sometimes it takes you a few rolls to actually get it, and oof. But geez, math is fun, right? And the programming involved here. How, wh what kind of trial and error you think they did to come to this conclusion? Like, this is how we should calculate it. This is a good idea. And this isn't even taking into account, like, the special balls. Like, what if we had used a nest ball? That would make this mess the ball modifier. Or, or the timer ball. <laughs> and again. If math and programming and logic interest you, then Brilliant is something you'll love. Link below, first 200 to use it, get 20% off the annual subscription. It really helps you polish your brain. Never stop using your noggin.